I'm Dan with the ESI, and this is panel number four. This is, I guess, the hump panel, um, which is a great uh, point in the day. Um, a few more panels before the tie gets loosened, the cummerbund comes off. But this is, this is sort of peak expo right here. Um, this is a great panel. I'm really looking forward to this. This is one I, I, I told all of our panelists this, I think, during our pre-calls. This is one of the panels that people tell me the most about. They just appreciate how so many different parts of the transportation sector, players in the transportation sector are willing to kind of come together and have this conversation, which is kind of unique. And so I'm really excited about the conversation we're about to have. Um, I don't know how, but we're basically on time. Um, and that means we will uh, probably go about 45 minutes or so. We'll have five minutes from each panelist. Uh, they'll tell us what we need to know for the rest of the conversation to make sense. And then we'll have some moderated Q&A. Uh, as always, I have questions sort of canned and ready to go, but if you have questions in the audience, we'll go we'll get those. Jillian is, well, actually, are you a timekeeper and a microphone? Or time? Okay, good. So Jillian is helping us with time, but also with microphone, and she'll make her way around the room. Without any further ado, we're going to dive right in. I'm going to start by introducing our first panelist, and we're just doing uh, very brief present, um, introductions. If you want to learn more about our panelists, and this goes for all of our panels, we have bio packets, so if you want should say that differently. Biopacket sounds like, <laughs> not sure what that means. We have packets of biographical information for all of our panelists, uh, and that's available outside this room and I think outside the exhibition space. We also have other great ESI resources, including a fact sheet we did last year, I think, on electric heavy duty trucks. So that would be a cool one for you to check out. So our first panelist is Michael Berube. Michael is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Sustainable Transportation at Fuels at the US Department of Energy. Michael, thank you so much. We're having just an a, a amazing turnout today from our friends at EERE and DOE. Thank you for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, well, hello, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. I just want to take a, a minute or two to talk a little bit about what DOE does in the transportation and fuel space. You may say, wait, DOE or DOT, but we at the Department of Energy um, have a very substantial program on advancing all aspects of clean fuels and technology and transportation. So to give you some for examples, maybe the last time you were flying on an airplane, you opened up that magazine and you looked in the back and you saw these airlines talking about sustainable aviation fuel and how they're starting to make more sustainable aviation fuel. That's EERE, that's the Biotechnologies Office, developing that technology, helping to prove that technology out. Some of you probably have heard of a, uh, the Clean Cities uh, and Communities Coalitions. We have 75 coalitions around the country, um, 20,000 uh, different stakeholders working locally on local transportation issues. That's EERE, and that's the Vehicle Technologies Office that does that. Many of you hopefully have heard about how much battery costs have dropped. Right, and you heard, boy, these battery costs coming down. We had a question earlier about the, uh, the, the non-vehicle side batteries. Developing those new batteries, that's EERE in the Vehicle Technologies Office. In fact, if you look at the batteries that are in your phone and in your laptop today, that is technology that has been developed by the Vehicle Technologies Office at EERE. The, you probably have heard a lot about clean hydrogen lately and uh, the National Clean Hydrogen Strategy, and the first time we set goals to produce 40 million metric tons of hydrogen by 2040, that's the Hydrogen Fuel Cell Technology Office inside of EERE as well. A lot of work lately on maritime. So uh, you maybe have heard that you know, these large, big ocean-going vessels, big container ships, are switching from what used to be called bunker fuel or uh, heavy fuel oil, really dirty fuel, to new fuel technologies. That is work that EERE is doing in the Biotechnologies Office, working very closely with our colleagues at the State Department and the International Maritime Organization to set new goals for clean shipping. Maybe you've heard about clean shipping corridors between Shanghai and LA, uh, between uh, Seattle and South Korea. That's work that we have been doing on the, at the Vehicle Technologies Office and across all of our offices. I certainly hope you've heard about EV charging network that's growing in the country. We are adding almost 1,000 chargers um, a week now, uh, about 190,000 chargers out there. The goal to install 500,000 chargers. We'll hit that goal well ahead of the 2030 original target we had. And the goal to have a DC fast charger, those really fast chargers, every 50 miles or closer on the highway. 
That's the joint office of energy and transportation. That's a joint office that's run between EERE and our colleagues at, uh, at DOT. So um, that gives you a little bit of a feel and a flavor of the breadth of different things that, that we do that are part of EERE and part of specifically whether it be the vehicle technologies office, the bioenergy, the hydrogen fuel cell, or the new joint office of energy and transportation. That's, that's the core of the work we do. Just that? Just that. All right. Um, I, 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 I'll give you some photocopying projects or there something you if you need some, if you have some spare time. Thank you, Michael. That was a great overview. Actually, a really great overview. Um, we did a briefing, uh, an online briefing, I think a couple well, a couple months ago, and we actually had um, Jeff Marutian on that briefing talking a little bit more in detail about sustainable aviation fuels. So that's one thing in particular ESI has a lot of resources about. Uh, our next panelist is Genevieve Cullen. Genevieve is the president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. Genevieve, it's always a delight to see you. Look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me, and thank you, Michael, for all the work that you do. That is um, a vast portfolio um, with, and full of alligators that you navigate <laughs> so beautifully. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, it's nice to see you all again. I'm Genevieve Cullen. I'm the president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. We are a cross-industry trade association uh, promoting the adoption of electric drive transportation. Um, we bring the entire value chain of electric drive transportation together. We advocate, we educate, and we accelerate the transition to electrified transportation. And although, since you all are here, I expect you're pretty savvy about these things, but I'm just going to take a minute and talk about what electric transportation is, um, or electric drive transportation is. Um, simply put, it is anything in which electricity moves the wheels. You hear a lot about plug-in electric vehicles, whether they're battery electric or plug-in hybrid, but also what's now known as traditional hybrids, and fuel cell vehicles. These are all part of the diverse suite of electric drive transportation. Um, and deploying these technologies across our transportation sector in the US and beyond is a path to energy, economic, and environmental security. And that's what we are working for. Um, I think uh, it might be useful just to take a second and say, um, so uh, how are we doing? Um, and thank you so much for your updated snapshot. Your number was better than mine on chargers, 190,000. There are, been, there are over 5.3 million uh, electric vehicles on the road. That includes uh, roughly 18,000 fuel cell vehicles. There are over 132 models to choose from today. By 2027, there'll be more than 100 additional models for consumers and businesses to choose, choose from. Uh, there have been, uh, there's been over $300 billion in announced investment across the, U the United States in building out the EV value chain here. Um, that is responsible, thanks to DOE. You're responsible for this part, too. Um, as of last year, reporting uh, the electrified vehicle segment supports over 370,000 jobs. If you add energy storage upstream and, and the associated jobs with the um, energy transmission distribution and the grid, that number reaches a million jobs in the United States that are part of the electrified transportation um, sector. So uh, we are growing um, by jobs, uh, energy, and economic benefits. And uh, so what's next for us? Uh, we want to build on our success. Uh, we want to keep adding vehicle models from micromobility to semis. We want to obviously keep growing the charging system, the charging ecosystem uh, to make sure that it is ubiquitous and accessible and affordable. And we want to make sure that it's fully integrated into the larger electricity grid so that we garner the optimize the benefits of electric transportation in the power sector as well. Um, and we also want to build more resilient and sustainable supply chains. So we still, we have, we have achieved a lot, but we have a lot more to do. And in order to do that, uh, our, we are also looking to ensure that there is a certainty in our policy signals so that 
We are not whipsawing back and forth uh, between policies, but we're building markets, we're building consumer access, and we're building U.S. leadership in this global race for clean transportation. Thank you, Genevieve. That was great. Uh, next up, we will hear from Alan Schaefer. Alan is the Executive Director of the Engine Technology Forum. Alan, thank you for joining us at this year's Policy Forum. We'll leave, turn it over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Dan, for having us, and uh, appreciate the chance to be here. Um, uh, and for including internal combustion engines in this discussion about sustainable transportation. Um, our organization, the Engine Technology Forum, um, was previously known as the Diesel Technology Forum, and last fall we made a change, a shift to expand our portfolio to deal with all kinds of internal combustion engines. So gasoline, natural gas, diesel, propane, um, and hydrogen, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, all of our members are involved in producing all of these technologies, including electric vehicles, uh, machines and equipment, et cetera. And we work in uh, a range of spaces, light duty automotive, trucking, construction, ag, marine rail, et cetera. Um, so what is the role for internal combustion engines and sustainable transportation? And you know, first and foremost, there is a role. I think that's important for everyone to understand here today. Um, um, really, they are the foundation of our transportation system. Uh, we think about the role that gas and, and diesel engines alone play in our, our personal mobility, but also in all the various sectors that serve our economy today and help us um, get what we need and where we need to go. Um, and we've largely been relying on fossil fuels, and uh, obviously that is a, a trend that is, is looking to change and to start using more uh, use of renewable biofuels. And I think the future is really more one of diversified fuels, such as electrification um, and renewable fuels uh, being used in internal combustion engines. Um, as we're seeing right now, this energy transition is, is uneven. It's, uh, it's not linear. Uh, things are not always occurring as folks might expect. And so that's why we need to keep a focus also on the fuels and technologies that are delivering for us today, and that's uh, internal combustion engines and the fuels that they use. Um, we just put out a, a new white paper earlier this week. I hope you'll take a moment to pick up a copy at our table at the exhibit or check us out online and get a full perspective about this role of internal combustion engines. Um, and I'll just put a fine point on it this way. Uh, internal combustion engines are going to continue to thrive and be part of our economy really for decades to come for three reasons. First, we have near sole reliance on internal combustion engines and the whole supporting infrastructure around them today in wide sectors of the global economy. In some of those sectors, there's really no suitable alternative for internal combustion yet. So we ask questions like, what can we do to clean up the fuel, as, as Michael said earlier, particularly in the marine um, uh, ocean-going shipping uh, sector? So the first reason is the, the near sole reliance on internal combustion engines and their role in the economy. Second is the continuous improvement of internal combustion engines, both gas and diesel. Um, we already have engines today that are quite close to zero emissions for criteria pollutants and much more fuel efficient, so they're lower in carbon dioxide emissions than previous generations. And we see also the tremendous opportunity to use renewable biofuels in all of these engines and machines and equipment to immediately reduce carbon and other emissions by considerable amount. And that's going to enable, <clears throat> excuse me, enable internal combustion engines to compete with alternatives uh, like electrification in the future. And then the third reason is really frankly due to the, the delays and uncertainties involved in the energy transition itself. It's going to take quite a while to build out the electric infrastructure. We've got some great progress that's already been discussed. But when we start looking at issues like heavy-duty vehicles and trucks, we have a long ways to go. So we don't want to waste um, uh, progress in the meantime. So we need to rely on the fuels and technology getting the job done today and doing it more efficiently and cleanly than ever before. Internal combustion engines are also expected to have more staying power in the future. Um, our report here shows that the market forecasts predict combined annual growth rate for internal combustion engines to be as much as 9% from 2023 through 2030. Um, EIA forecasts that if we have the same, or we have increased economic activity, growth in the population, and continue to pr promote mobility, we will have more internal combustion vehicles on the road in 2050 than we do today. So um, clearly this technology is not going anywhere. How can we improve it and make it more efficient? And we appreciate the chance to be here and, and talk about that more with you today. 
Thank you, Alan. So, uh, speaking of doing better with fuels, that brings us to our next panelist, John Fuhrer. John is the Vice President of Government Affairs with Growth Energy. John, it's great to see you again. I'm looking forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Oh, John, could you? Yeah, there you go. There we go. Thank you, Alan. Uh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Just a couple things, and I think Alan really has done a good job of, of laying out I think that the broad swath of technologies that are going to be needed, you know, decarbonizing transportation is going to be a very difficult task. It's not one that can be accomplished with one technology, one, one type of, of energy platform. And so my group represents ethanol producers across the country. Uh, primarily, we, we are starch-based ethanol. We use grain to, to convert that into an alcohol that can be burnt in, in multiple modes of transportation. But I think that only encompasses one component of, of how this energy transition could work. And, and as we look at decarbonizing the transportation sector, again, not, not one single thing is going to do that. And, el and alcohol is essentially a platform for different types of fuels, whether it's in light-duty vehicles, uh, whether it's in sustainable aviation fuel, which I think is a really exciting opportunity. It's one that will be incredibly difficult to do with, with electrification. Um, we had Michael talk about marine fuels. That's another application where you can really use biofuels like, like ethanol. And then again, with heavy duty shipping, you can actually uh, remake a diesel engine to use ethanol as a fuel source. So there are lots of different ways that you can build uh, upon some of these, these technologies that we all are talking about here. And I think it's important to remember this is not, there's not one silver bullet. There's not one single pathway forward. And as, as we think about the energy transition uh, with our members, we're solely focused on reducing our carbon intensity of our fuel. And there's lots of different ways that you can do that. You can do that through the production of the feedstock that goes into the finished fuel. You can do that with specific things at the plant. And I think one of the easiest ways uh, to help decarbonize biofuels is through carbon capture technology. Um, and why I say that, it's really easy to capture fermented, uh, fermented carbon. So essentially, when you look at my members' facilities, just think of it, for lack of a better word, it's like a giant industrial size still. It's a very efficient way to make alcohol. And whenever you make alcohol, no matter whether it's beverages or any sort of distilled spirits, you're going to have carbon. And you can capture that carbon very easily. It's a pure stream of carbon. In fact, it's utilized in a lot of different ways. Um, dry ice uh, primarily comes from, from my facilities. Uh, some of that carbon is used to uh, help filter municipal water for food and beverage applications. Any of you who like have, a, have a, a can of beer, have a can of soda. Whenever you click that open, there's a little bit of carbon in there that's probably captured from one of my facilities. But it's really easy to capture that carbon and to store it underground. And it's something that I think we'll see over the, the coming decades. And I think that's a really, it's a really good platform, particularly when we talk about aviation. And that's, again, a spot where I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think there's a lot of pathways forward there as well. I'll close with this and just say, um, I think that this is a great conversation to have, Dan, and I think that this really this panel really demonstrates the broad swath of pathways to decarbonize transportation in general. Uh, and I'm happy to be here and happy to take questions at the right time. Great, thank you very much, John. It's great to have you. Uh, that brings us to our fifth panelist of the panel, Lisa Jerem. Lisa is a senior director for bus operations. Excuse me, senior director of bus operations and new vehicle technologies. The American Public Transportation Association. Lisa, welcome to the Expo and Policy Forum. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. I've been in the audience at times, so it's nice to be up here um, representing APTA at this panel. Um, yeah, I have a really long title um, at work. Um, they mostly call me the bus lady at APTA. That's kind of what I am. So, uh, however, I'll be talking overall about um, what we do at APTA and how our perspective on this topic. I'll talk about it from two different perspectives. One is sort of transit itself as a way of being a more sustainable way to travel. Um, I will talk a little bit about technology and something that's happening in the transit world um, to shift towards zero emission buses. So first off, a quick reminder, as we've already talked about, about why it's important to talk about this topic. Um, transportation is, the sector in transportation emits more greenhouse gases than any other sector of the economy. So obviously it's critical to think about how to reduce greenhouse gases and be more sustainable in transportation. Transit helps to do that. Um, it's inherent, obviously, in transit that we're talking about um, shifting folks from single occupancy use vehicles to um, a sort of more of a, a shared ride uh, experience. So in, transit itself is kind of inherently sustainable. There is, a, I want to mention a report that came out in 2021 
from the Transportation Research Board that quantifies how communities that invest in public transit reduce the nation's carbon emissions by 63 million metric tons annually. So that's kind of inherent in having public transit as part of your, um, oops, I'm a little close. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to be shouting to everybody. Um, all right. So anyway, but beyond its inherent ride-sharing efficiencies, public transportation kind of provides the foundation for communities um, and regions um, to have a base for their transportation service that is less reliant on a single occupancy use vehicle and um, gives more opportunities as well. I, I don't, this is a little bit different from the sustainability side of it, and maybe we'll talk about sort of the equity component but the other part about transit is it's, uh, it's a transportation system for everybody. It's something that's there for everybody to have, um, which is a really critical piece of the transit element as well. Um, I do want to mention, too, that we are constantly looking to improve the service. We want to try to, as much as possible, make it an attractive alternative for um, people to ride transit instead of just riding in their cars. Um, there have been significant investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law um, and from the Inflation Reduction Act. And transit agencies are really using those. They're using them to build out more service. They're using it to enhance existing service. Um, again, just talking about on the bus side, where I tend to work, um, a lot of agencies are implementing what we call bus rapid transit service. It's a type of bus service um, that basically it makes the the route's faster, so the whole service is faster, and brings in some elements to the bus service that are kind of comparable to what you might think of as a light rail service, but for uh, much less cost. So it's a very efficient way to improve um, your transit systems. Um, a lot of agencies are looking to kind of rethink their bus networks, especially post-COVID, with travel patterns having changed quite significantly. Uh, a lot of agencies are kind of doing a whole rethink and redesign of their bus networks. So all of that is, is being supported by these investments um, and then another area I want to talk about is how transit really practices what it preaches. Um, we at APTA have a sustainability commitment program, and through that, transit agencies actually quantify themselves operationally how sustainable they are, looking at a whole range of factors, things like their water use, um, their recycling, their energy use, and their operations. So transit itself, it's really kind of part of our core mission to be sustainable, and we do as I said, we do practice what we preach, um, which leads to the final point, which has to do with the advent of zero emission bus technology. Um, and as Genevieve kind of indicated, so when I say zero emission, what I'm really talking about is battery electric buses and fuel cell electric buses. It's also happening on the rail side, so I don't want to leave out our friends on the rail side, but the bus side is really kind of where we've seen the biggest push initially. Um, and transit really is, I think, acting as first movers in the medium and heavy duty space in adopting this new technology. Transit's not the biggest um, market, uh, the trucking market, for example, much, much bigger market, much larger fleet, bigger impact on greenhouse gas emissions, but transit has kind of traditionally led the way on adopting low emission and now zero emission technologies. Uh, the total fleet that we have, total bus fleet in the US, over 50% of that is a low emission technology. Um, so we're already very clean and then we're uh, moving towards zero emission. And again, as I said, a lot of the lessons that are gonna be learned through transit will then be able to be um, utilized in other sectors of transportation um, as they move forward into uh, to the zero emission space. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we have some questions in the audience before, uh, as we make our way over. I want to, Lisa, I want to ask a follow-up question based on something that you said. And Michael, maybe perhaps we could start with you and then go down through the line. And that is, um, there's a lot of investment happening in, in this space and in, in sustainable transportation. And you know, some of it's coming from Congress, some of it's coming from states, some of it's, com it's coming from all over. But for folks up here on Capitol Hill, one of the things they're watching when it comes to the implementation, especially of the, of the recent investments that the Congress has enacted, uh, is how these investments are done in a, in a way that makes sustainable transportation more equitable, more accessible for people. Uh, I'm sure there's always sort of a first mover, uh, you know, with, with new technologies, but like, you know, ultimately, like you were saying, for transportation to, to really work, it has to be available. We have to be able to yeah. use it. And Michael, what are some steps that you're taking at DOE to help ensure that the next generation of investments in sustainable transportation are, are equitable and accessible for people? You know, I think one of the, um, one of the first things was just upfront working with, with Congress when the different funding programs were put in place 
to make sure we were broad-based, which they are. They're hitting a broad range of the country, geographically, economically, the types of fuels, types of technology. We heard that from Senator Wyden. That, that's like really at its core initially. Um, I think one of the next things that we have been doing is through, the, through our Clean Cities and Communities Coalitions, we very quickly you know, recognize that a lot of money would be coming out the door. And people are quickly trying to apply for that and how to, how to get access, how to use it. Big focus on um, Justice 40 and on equity. One of the things we did is we wanted to build up capacity within local communities. So we spent a lot of time and provided funding to our coalitions to work with local communities to understand what are their needs. I think one of the first things is to make sure we're listening to those communities, asking. Uh, we talked about this in EV charging. Um, just placing an EV charger in a location that on a map says it's a, um, a underserved or low-income community doesn't necessarily mean you're meeting the needs of that community. You have to sit and talk with the community. What are their needs? What are their needs now? What are they going to be in the future? And have a more holistic perspective. So having that type of dialogue and providing that type of technical assistance, um, I and, and quite honestly, having the funding for the capacity among uh, environmental justice communities that they can then better take advantage of the money is one of the things. And Genevieve, for electric vehicles, but also the charging infrastructure, what are some steps that industry mm -hmm. is taking to ensure that those technologies and, and vehicles are available to everyone? Well, let me just take it um, up a flight to begin and point out that um, we realize that the burden of poor air quality is borne disproportionately in disadvantaged communities. Electrification is an essential tool in addressing that disproportionate impact. And so electrifying public transit and private transportation is not only the way forward on greenhouse gas reductions, it also is a, a prerequisite to making more equitable outcomes in, in, in environmental and public health. Um, so, in, but ensuring access to these solutions involves um, it, de program design, as Michael has said, a lot of the programs that advance electrification that were in the IRA, in fact, have set-asides directed at serving disadvantaged uh, communities, energy communities, um, which is it's a relatively new term, um, but uh, that communities transitioning from uh, away from uh, fossil fuel uh, industries and who are looking to <coughs> reinvent jobs, economic opportunity, and, and clean air in, in, in their environments. Um, access to charging has to be um, essentially ubiquitous, and it has to be as diverse as the folks who need access to, uh, to transportation. And that's, and that's not only the so bus depot charging, but it's charging for folks who live in, um, they call multi-unit dwellings. Is that the term of art now? Yep. The mud? Mm -hmm. um, I think people need to work on that. But anyway, um, that we need to be thoughtful in not where we put our investments, but how we design our communities and right down to the, like, to the nitty gritty of building codes and making sure that as we are updating our building codes, we recognize that um, integrating make ready solutions so that there's charging opportunities in all new construction and um, housing at every level is, is a way to make sure that there is um, equal access to a clean transportation solution. And Alan, I assume that you know, better, more sustainable, cleaner versions of existing technologies, that's probably a nexus point where affordability and accessibility also come into play. What are some steps that you all are taking to ensure that the, the, the latest and greatest are finding, its way, finding their way to um, you know, communities that need those benefits? Sure, <clears throat> thanks for the question. Um, just give you an example. A few years ago, we were contacted by an environmental group out on Long Island who was really trying to get a upgraded switcher locomotive to, to um, serve the Long Island rail system, which serves uh, the New York City metro area and out to the, to the east. And they were looking for data and information about what the best and available solutions were. And of course, upgrading to a tier four locomotive, which is the cleanest available, was in fact that solution. So for that particular community, um, that was their answer, and so we were, we were happy to provide that kind of information. Um, I think when we approach equity, we have to also think about sort of a fair representation of sustainable energy systems. And the example I'll give you is this. We, 
We often hear about emissions in localized communities and cities and around freight corridors and uh, ports is another great example. And tremendous progress has been made there in bringing some of the alternatives around. Um, but one thing I, I, I will say is that a lot of times the community groups feel like electrification is the answer. And that is all that they will accept. And they don't want to talk to folks about other kind of fuels and technologies. When we know that it's going to take a good long time before electrification is able to provide any benefits to that community on the ground in their streets. And so we have to be honest about how we talk about these solutions. Um, we did a study uh, two years ago that asked the simple question in the 10 northeastern states, what would be the best way to decarbonize the heavy duty trucking sector in the next decade? Would it be full electrification of heavy duty trucks? I'm talking about the class eight trucks now, the big rigs, if you will. Or would it be turning over the fleet from old technology diesel to the newest generation diesel and using 100% renewable diesel fuel? Which would be the better option and bring faster benefits to the community? The answer was get rid of the old diesel and use renewable diesel. It delivered three times the greenhouse gas reduction at 25% of the cost. And I think that's, that's an important fact that we have to approach these kind of discussions with. And that's, you know, there are many choices. Let's not just focus on one going in as the answer because it may not be the answer. And if we want to have equitable benefits across communities, I think honesty with them about the state of technology, how long till they're going to get benefits is a key part of that. And John, we'll go to you next. You know, I, I think one thing that, that Alan really touched on is the, the concept of cost. And, I, and I, for, for me, I'm going to go more cost to the consumer. And I think when you look at solutions uh, that focus on electricity, obviously there can be a huge cost savings to a consumer. I think in general, when, you, when consumers do uh, any sort of purchase regarding energy, uh, whether it's energy for transportation or energy for their home, you know, one of the things that really comes to mind for them is cost. And I will say, you know, we, we've done a lot of studies around what people think when they pull up to a gas pump. And the number one thing that drives them, 95 plus percent is cost. So if you can find a way to connect with consumers on cost and, and how that matters, that's what, that's what really draws them in. And for, for an ethanol-related fuel, we have the ability. We've, we've traded at parity or, or less than gasoline for many, many years now. And so offering a lower cost, lower carbon solution tends to really grab consumers. So I would say the concept of cost, and we look at electrification, there's obviously a benefit. You don't have to go to a gas station anymore, right? Finding that way to connect with consumers on cost, I think, means a lot when you talk about equitable treatment and accessibility. I can see cost being number one, but for me, number two would be actual windshield washer fluid in the little <laughs> bin and not just water. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a perk that is not <laughs> widespread enough. Uh, Lisa, you kind of inspired the question with your comments. Oh, sure. uh, so I'm curious to bring it back to you. You know, how are yeah. we ensuring that more people have more access to you know, sustainable transit and, and public transportation? Yeah, so again, just as I you did say before, I, I, you know, I feel good to say that you know, transit is inherently about equity as well as sustainability. I mean, it is, it is really genuinely meant to be there for everybody, whether or not, if for some reason you are unable to drive a car or you don't have access to a car, that is really, it is meant to be there. Um, and I think um, it really um, was highlighted during COVID when we saw very dramatic um, decreases in transit ridership. Right, people are staying home. It was a very odd situation. We were sort of told, you don't want people on the transit because it's too crowded and we don't want to spread COVID. Um, but buses in particular, um, they kind of maintained their ridership at the highest level and have recovered at the highest level because who rides the buses? It was the essential workers who ride the buses. It's folks who really don't have access to other vehicles. And I, it really became so very like concrete to me how important transit is in providing equitable transportation because it is a service that's there um, for everyone. Um, again, talking about the zero emission technology component of it, so we are also then looking to make those buses um, even lower emission or zero emission. Um, just highlight one quick thing that a lot of transit agencies are doing. So a lot of agencies are putting together their transition plan to go all zero emission bus for their entire fleet, right? It's gonna happen over time, it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, and quite a lot of them have made equity uh, a key part of the planning process. So when they decide where to roll out, like say the next 10 buses they're gonna have or the next 20 that's coming in, 
one of the elements is taking into consideration whether or not the community they can put it into is a previously disadvantaged community in some way, or maybe they did have like a, you know, a depot where they had diesel buses. So actually they've actively made that one of the like metrics in their decision making process for their zero emission bus transition. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks for your patience. Do so you have a question? Yes, I do. I spent uh, over 30 years on ships. So the maritime industry is what I'm mostly interested in. In fact, I'm actually teaching merchant mariners today. The IMO has positioned themselves to look to get to zero carbon by 2050. And anywhere from 30 to 40% 40 by 2030. Those are pretty aggressive goals. Now, MAN and Wartzilla, big diesel engine manufacturers for the big ships, are developing ammonia fuel systems, methanol fuel systems, I would assume ethanol as well. I know Maersk, a big shipping company, is, has some methanol ships already, and they're building ammonia ships. That's all well and good. These goals are very aggressive. How do we get there? This is going to cost trillions of dollars, literally, to do it globally. How do we get there? Um, this one's up for anyone. So, Michael, would you like to go first? The um, they are aggressive goals. I think the, the early year goals in particular. Um, although, when you look at the numbers, uh, I, I you know it's meant to build up. You know, first demonstrate two hundred ships, get you know forty ports, et cetera, That you can do it. Um, I think we're going to do it. It's going to be those new fuels. It's going to be a combination of ammonia and methanol for your ocean-going ships. It's going to be um, some biofuels, absolutely, as well, for the harder to decarbonize and low carbon, uh, low carbon, low greenhouse gas fuels that we'll be getting, as I was mentioned earlier, the technology is getting better and better that we're developing again down towards net zero. That's why the, a lot of absolutely. So when you look, absolutely, and but when you look at the country today, we spend trillions and trillions and trillions today on infrastructure. And so part of that is orienting that infrastructure dollars towards new fuels. Um, in a number of these cases, we are focused on actually new fuels that actually can have lower cost opportunity that helps pay off some of the infrastructure. Um, but, you know, the IRA and the infrastructure law that were passed have billions of dollars in infrastructure. That's a very initial start, small piece. Uh, we're going to need to grow be well beyond 2030 on uh, new fuels and infrastructure. I, I will say, um, yeah, I work globally on zero emission shipping uh, among my different portfolio. And... I'm impressed that the conversation today is much different than it was three or four years ago. Today, the conversation is very much of a commitment to, we have to get there, how do we do it? What are the pieces we do? How do we set the bunkering up? There's gonna be new, new bunkering needed in new places, but it's not mission impossible. We've built up over the last 30 years a lot of infrastructure. Over the next 30, we'll have to build up new infrastructure. Um, any other qu uh, comments on the, on the panel? I'll just, I'll just go quickly. I, I think you've, you point out something that's absolutely true. You know, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's similar to, to aviation, right? I, I think marine and aviation are in a very similar position in that electrification of those sectors will be incredibly difficult. And so you're going to have to have some sort of lower carbon liquid fuel. I think hydrogen plays a huge role in this too. You know, obviously hydrogen is how you get your source of ammonia. You just add some nitrogen to it, the most, the most readily available element in the, in the atmosphere. So I think that there certainly are applications here, and I think um, you know over the next several decades you'll see some ships that will have some dual use capacities, whether it's a bunker type fuel or some sort of newer biofuel or, or, or alcohol based fuel. Thanks, uh, and Jillian. We had a question two rows back, and then we'll come up to you next. Thanks for the cool panel. Um, so you mentioned uh, carbon capture and uh, and also cost of ethanol and how it can be. But carbon capture is pretty expensive. Um, I know you're, you said you're talking about a, a purely carbon stream. It's obviously going to be a lot better than direct air capture. But do you have data on how much per ton uh, that costs and, and just how that sort of fits into that bigger picture? Yeah, I think when you look at capturing um, biogenic carbon from an ethanol facility, again, it's, you know, it's you know, anytime you ferment anything, any sort of grain, any sort of sugar, uh, into alcohol, the other byproduct that comes out is carbon. Um, in terms of cost, you know, I, I would say there's a reason why they set the values they did in the IRA at 85 bucks a ton for capture and 60 for utilization, because that's generally what, what this stuff costs. So, you know, 
there is a societal benefit to this, and I will say not having to remove other impurities from the source of carbon like you would in some sort of a combustion stream, you know, that makes it a little easier. It's going to be a little less costly. Uh, but again, these are all, you know, tens of millions of dollars each, similar to an air, a direct air capture. This is all a significant amount of money, and frankly, you can't really reduce the cost of that until you get a few more operating. There are only just a couple, just a handful of operating carbon capture wells in this country, and a couple of them are attached to an ethanol facility, and probably about three or four of them. So there is there is a cost to this, um, and it's it's similar. Going to it's going to be similar in value to what you'd see in terms of 45Q values. When you look at the cost um, and the tax credits, I mean, coming off of an ethanol plant, that's where carbon capture makes like just so much sense. It's just easy. It's, it's clean. You're bringing it back into your process. You already have a bio refinery right there to be able to capture and utilize that. Um, so whether you're capturing it or actually bringing it back in and doing a CO2 to fuels type process, um, it will definitely make sense. I think you know, pretty much every major ethanol facility and company is looking at uh, really doubling down on that as one of the first easy ways to help hit much deeper decarbonization. I mean, one of the great Things that people don't realize about biofuels is that they are um, and can be very low greenhouse gas. They can be even uh, net negative. Uh, our goal is to get them up into the 80% plus. Some will be a little less, some will be more, but then the carbon capture can help with that for sure. And you had your hand up, so we'll go to you next in that. You might get the last question in. Oh my gosh, okay. Well, thank you all so much. I had a question just because you are kind of sitting in uncharted territory. You're looking at electrifying a transportation section and moving away from standard um, gasolines, but maybe my question is, how does a hybrid engine play into the discussions you're having? And then also, what are some of your wondering questions as subject matter or subject matter experts? So, uh, anyone want to tackle the first, which I think is where hybrid technologies fit in, and then maybe to paraphrase, what are you? What's the other big things you're thinking about? <laughs> I, I would. Um, I'll just uh, on the hybrid. Um, today, there's a number of uh, kind of let's take mild hybrid vehicles that help you get up in the in the fuel efficiency. When we think about uh, electric vehicles, we basically are thinking about plug-in hybrids, where you have a battery giving you maybe. Uh, 40 miles of range, hopefully, uh, or full battery battery electric. The most OEMs recognize long term, it is lower cost to the consumer, it's lower cost to the system to have a full battery electric. That's where you really save the big dollars. Um, but there will be definitely use of plug-in hybrids in the interim period, uh, especially if people maybe have two two cars running, they want to have you know the range from plug-in hybrid with gasoline still. But I think that will be kind of an interim any other comments on the first part of the question, Genevieve, and then maybe to John? Um, so uh, it's, it's a good question, and it points out the fact is that electric transportation actually is a spectrum of electrification. And, um, and as noted by the folks on this panel, we need diverse solutions, and hybrids actually have a role within those diverse solutions, and very much so in, um, in the heavy-duty segment, hybridization, um, and even in a modular way, like a hybrid diesel applications, hybrids that use um, renewable fuels in their, um, in their non-electric operations. So it is absolutely a part of the portfolio. And again, it, because it, drive cycles are so diverse that we're going to need a lot of solutions. Just <clears throat> piling on a little bit, um, hybrids are, are, are definitely a, a big opportunity for enhancing the performance of internal combustion engines. We have hybrids today, not only in, in the highway vehicles, but also as uh, hybrid wheel loaders. Um, major pieces of construction equipment are, are hybridized and have been for some time. So it's a, it's a technology that works well and brings added benefits to the operator and, of course, saves fuel costs. I think most most everyone's touched on this, but I think another aspect when you think about hybrids, it's cost, right? Um, in the short term, um, you know, having something where you can get more efficiency out of out of the uh, the energy that goes in certainly is is beneficial. Um, and again, you tie that back to consumers. I think generally most consumers have uh, there's some who are maybe electricity. Uh, they're not quite ready for it. Most people are going to be ready for a hybrid. So, I think that's what I'd end with. I'll make a real quick comment, which is just to add on that, um, yeah, uh, hybrid buses have definitely been an important part of the transition for uh, the transit bus fleet to being um, a cleaner fleet. 
Um, and another interesting um, component is that some of the agencies that have done a lot of hybrid bus deployments, um, King County Metro is a good example in Seattle. Um, one of the things that is a little bit of a challenge, I think, for agencies is transitioning from how do you deal with an electrified you know, drivetrain in terms of like, how, what do the mechanics do and how do you make sure it's safe or there's a high voltage you know, concern, things like that. So a lot of the agencies that have done hybrid buses are a little bit ahead. They've kind of already done some of that work. So it's also just helpful, again, I think, like you said, it's, it's a spectrum and also agencies that have done that can kind of you know, use what they've learned and, and benefit from that as they transition to, say, you know, an all electric fleet. And you had a second part, which is sort of like, a, what's a one big thing for people to think about? So is that a fair approximation? Yeah, basically like as subject matter experts, like what are your wondering questions right now that you're trying to solve? All right, so Lisa, maybe what we'll do is we'll start with you and we'll end with Michael. Uh, unless, Michael, you really want to go first. You were like, you were right there. I'll, I'll, I'll go give you a second thing. Um, to achieve the goals we have to in transportation, we are going to have to have a all of government approach. So one of the things I want to kind of make sure to uh, plug for people is two years ago, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy and EPA and HUD, why else all got together to write the first U.S. transportation decarbonization blueprint. And we have since been writing very detailed action plans for every mode, rail, maritime, aviation, on-road, off-road vehicles, light duty. Um, but in, it's very much an all a government approach that I think is going to allow us to get there. The comment was asked about infrastructure. We need to do a lot of things across a lot of modes. But um, I think if we put our mind together collectively, work together, we can get there. Genevieve, one big thing. Just the one? Just the one? Uh, I think the, the one big thing is that um, industry and government and smart folks in the R&D world need to be thinking about how do we make the power sector and the transportation sector work together in the most efficient, equitable, and optimized way that makes the grid stronger, more resilient, and more capable of using renewables and ensures that um, there, is, there are new storage solutions that make us more secure and at the same time make transportation cleaner, cheaper, quieter, funner. Great. Thanks. Alan, one thing you're thinking about? Sure. Well, as we, um, as we think about the future for internal combustion, we have some major emission milestones coming in the 2027, beginning uh, at that point. But I would say that uh, most of our members are really thinking about how we can make the federal government and some of the state governments work work closely together so we have some kind of harmonized approach. We have an approach that's diverging now from California and a number of following states to other states. And transportation really knows no borders. So if you're driving a heavy duty truck from New York to California, um, what are your fueling options? Where are you? Um, what's the best way to get the job done? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's really what we're worried about. It's mobility and supporting our, our economy and, and quality of life. So I think you know, getting cooperation from uh, the federal state, you know, more harmonized approach to how we're doing business here would make a lot of sense. John? I'll say getting large volumes of net zero liquid fuel and having those be available for multiple different transportation platforms, I think would be a really good thing. I think it would, it would, it would go really nicely with more electrification, and then you'd have a full attack on carbon and transportation, a full pathway to decarbonize the whole sector. Lisa, I think this means you get the last word on the okay. panel today. I, I did like that. It was an interesting point about, um, you know, if, if I'm going down into the weeds, one of the things we think about is just some of the practical things, like like with fuel cell buses, how do we get that hydrogen infrastructure um, out there for transit agencies? But I think probably at a bigger level, you know, uh, again, this is obviously just kind of transit specific, is we're always wanting to make sure we balance sort of very ambitious goals with understanding that on a day-to-day -day basis, the most important thing that we do is that we put buses on the street and that we put out our, you know, rail service. And so you're always trying to figure out how do you, you know, you want to do these ambitious things. It's great to, make, to do those things, but we also got to make sure that we're just really, you know, continuing to provide the central service that we provide. So that's probably the thing that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Great. Uh, thanks to the great questions. That was great. Uh, and thank you, Michael, Genevieve, Alan, John, and Lisa for being great panelists. It was an awesome discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you.